الحمد لله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وقر بزدني علما اللهم صل وبارك وسلم على حبيبنا على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على أفضل خلق الله أجمعين اللهم اجعلنا من رفقائه في الجنة اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنا اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يقبل عليهم يوم القيامة مبتسما آخذ بأيدينا الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all, uh, what, a, what a joy to be uh, back in these gatherings uh, which we were really deprived of and now increasingly uh, people saying that uh, you know, there was just a lot of madness during that time but unpre- unprecedented time. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the gathering and mashallah, I know a lot of people um, wanted to be here but because it uh, was so overwhelmingly uh, just uh, desirable that so many of you came out early. And so, inshallah, people that are online that weren't able to be here in person, we thank you for just your patience. And inshallah, one day we'll have a uh, much larger uh, place to gather, but this is a blessed place. It's a sanctified place. It was built for God at the height of the depression, and it was given to us by Christians uh, for us to worship our Lord as we understand him. Alhamdulillah. So mindfulness is a very interesting uh, term. It's become very popular, as Dr. Aisha um, said. One of the things about mindfulness is it's actually a relatively recent word. It goes back to the 16th century, but it was almost entirely neglected until about uh, uh, 1965. And from then on, you see this rise. So if you look online, you can see usage, and you see this line, it just goes nothing, and then suddenly, around the 1960s, it starts to creep up, and by 2019, it's, it's gone way up. And, and there's so many things about mindfulness online. Everybody uh, now has had some experience, if you live in America, especially in California, with this idea of mindfulness. So you have, now they have corporations that have mindfulness. Uh, so they, they have people come and they tell you how to be more mindful. Um, but what's really unusual to me is, what is your mind full of? Because one of the most interesting things about the modern concept of mindfulness, it's actually what we would call dhikrun nafs. Like you're doing remembrance of yourself. So where does this term come from? I got interested in just, where did this all come from? Well, it came from Buddhism. Because uh, the Buddha, who I actually wrote an article uh, in a book on Buddhism and Islam. Uh, A lot of people don't know this, but the Afghanis were actually great Buddhists. And Afghanistan was one of the major Buddhist centers in the, uh, the pre-modern world. And they became Muslim very quickly. Uh, in fact, the great shrine keepers, uh, who are known as the Barmekids, Barmak was not a family. It was actually a clan that kept the Buddhist shrine in Afghanistan. So the Baramika were actually Buddhists that converted to Islam, and then they actually helped bring all of their administrative knowledge into uh, the Abbasid uh, Empire. So uh, I I think it's very interesting that so many Buddhists became Muslim. And I was struck by the fact that one of the great um, heresiologists and uh, Ash'ari scholars in a book I was reading, he actually had the Buddhists as a, a section in sects, um, and what they call milal and nihal, uh, which is uh, religions and sects. So he had the section on Buddha, and he said, 
if what the Buddhists say is true about this man, he must be al-Khidr, which really struck me. And so then I started researching all of what Muslims have said about al-Khidr, and the parallels between al-Khidr and Buddhist, Buddha are amazing. So I wrote this uh, article called Buddha in the Quran, question mark. And uh, it was actually translated into Arabic by the Ministry of Awqaf in Morocco because the minister was uh, very uh, struck by uh, the argument. Because al-Khidr, according to our tradition, was actually a prince who escapes from the palace and goes on this journey in search of knowledge and then has ilm ladunni. It's not revelation, it's a type of enlightenment uh, that happens. So the Buddha talked about uh, mindfulness, and he actually has a very famous, uh, in the, it's, it's called Sati Pathana, which is a lecture that he gave on mindfulness. So then I wanted to know, well, what was the word that they translated from mindfulness? And it's a Pali word, which is the original language of Buddha, and in fact, Dr. Cleary argues that in the, what, the earliest Buddhist manuscript, which is called the Dhammapada, that the Buddha actually predicted the coming of the Prophet Muhammad So it's very interesting that the word is called sati. So I looked up sati, pali, what, what did it originally mean? I want to know what it originally meant. And it meant remembrance of the sacred scriptures. So it actually literally means remembrance. So it's dhikr. So mindfulness that's been translated into English from sati is really dhikr. So then it becomes, what are you doing dhikr of? That's the question. Now we live in an age of immense distractions. Arguably, this is the most distracted age in human history. Now, what does distraction mean? Well, according to the dictionary, it means a state of being distracted. This is what drove people like Derrida crazy. But the second meaning is mental distress or derangement. Mental distress or derangement. Thank you, that helps. Mental distress or derangement. Now, isn't it interesting that we're living in one of the most mentally deranged times in human history, where people no longer even know what they are? They've forgotten God. They think that this is all meaningless and they're completely distracted. So what are they distracted from, and who's distracting them? One of the problems with distraction is, if you're looking for it, there's plenty of people that will help you find it. And so there are all these merchants out there that are trying to advert, turn your attention toward. That's what advert means, to turn towards. So an advertisement is to entice you and to get your attention. Now, social media was designed to keep you on it. They don't call it surfing the web for nothing. First of all, a web, what do you do with a web? A spider knows what you do with a web. You capture flies, you liquidate their innards, and then you suck the life out of them, and then there's just a shell lying there on the web, right? What's a net? Like, internet? What's a net for? A net's for catching things, right? So now as somebody who actually surfed in my younger days, one of the really interesting things about surfing is you're just trying to stay on. The wave has you. You're not controlling the wave. The wave is controlling you. You're just trying to stay afloat. And so surfing the web, you're just moving, and it's taking you. So distraction creates mental distress. The third meaning in the dictionary is that which divides attention. The word in, in uh, English, decide to decide something, is, comes from a word which means to cut off, decidere. Why would decide mean to cut off? Because what you decide cuts off everything else. Once you've made your decision, you're cutting off other things. And you've made your decision. And so, people 
have to make decisions like where do you spend your time what do you give your time to now the word in arabic for distraction is ilha ilhaun which means to pull somebody into lahu to bring them into entertainment which in the dictionary is the pleasurable occupation of the mind so who's who's occupying your mind now what you give your attention to will determine your reality what you give your attention to will determine your reality what does that mean it means that if you're always watching news about crime you're going to think that crime is far more prevalent than it actually is and you will be scared you'll be walking around thinking like chicken little that the sky is falling so what you give your attention to is going to determine your reality and what god is asking us is to give our attention to god now what is the in arabic intention what is the attention well in english it has a lot of really interesting meanings one of them is courtesy like you say he was very attentive to me attentions are what a lover gives their beloved attention is also a word for devotion so your attention is your devotion it's what you're attending to it's what you're giving your time to so in Arabic, one of the words for it is ihtimam. It's what you're concerned with. It's your hum. It's what preoccupies your mind. It's what your mind is full of. And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, مَنْ جَعَلَ هُمُومُهُ هَمَّنْ وَاحِدًا كَفَ اللَّهُ لَهُ سَائِرَ الْهُمُومُ Whoever makes his concerns, in other words, gives his attention to one thing, Allah will take care of all of his other concerns. What's that? Hamm al akhirah. It's Hamm al akhirah. So we're living in a time where people's concerns are completely fragmented. And so there's all this mental derangement because people are so distracted. Now, Imam Ali anhu said, and it's often attributed to the Prophet, and it very well may be marfu' because it is often said with Allah Rasulullah. An nasu niyam. فَإِذَا مَاتُوا انتبهوا. He didn't say استيقظوا. If they die, they wake up. No. They come to attention. انتباه is, is نبيه is somebody who's, who's smart, intelligent, because he's focused. He's giving his attention to what's important. And so انتباه is what happens when people die. The Prophet ﷺ said, in one iteration, Die before you die. In other words, come to attention before you're brought to attention. And in Sahih Muslim, it's Consider yourselves already dead. It has the same meaning. In other words, wake up now. And this is what mindfulness is really about. It's dhikr. It's coming to one of the words for attention in Arabic is also yaqadha. It's to be awake and aware. You're attentive, you're aware, your mind is present. So already by the 1880s, Nietzsche noted, one thinks with one's watch in one's hand, he complained. Even as one eats one's midday meal while reading the latest news of the stock market. This is distraction. Everything is done with the clock. One of the most interesting things about time, and one of my favorite writers, Lewis Mumford, said that when the modern mindset came to dominate, this is what he wrote, eternity ceased gradually to serve as the measure and focus of human actions. In its place came the dictatorship of the clock. I mean, isn't that interesting? People used to think about eternity 
their lives were actually determined by their understanding of eternity. And one of the most common things about pre-modern peoples is they mention death a lot. And one of the most notable qualities of modern people and postmodern people is they never talk about death. Why did the pre-modern people talk about death? When I was in the throne room of the former Queen Elizabeth, now the throne room of King Charles, uh, I was taken there by Baroness Udine. She's a Muslim in the House of Lords. So they took me into the throne room. I was getting a tour of uh, the parliament. And they have, so they have this throne room. And there was this massive clock given by the French king to the, the British monarch that had the Grim Reaper on top of it. That's what the clock had. It had the Grim Reaper. In other words, the angel of death was on top of it with his scythe that, that takes the souls. In all of, if you look, and Dr. Yusuf knows this because he's been working with sundials, in all of the pre-modern sundials, it will say things like carpe diem, many Latin phrases, things like, in one of these hours you will be seized. People saw time as a reminder of their fi uh, finitude, as the reminder that they were finite beings in temporality. Modern people think they're going to live forever. They don't think about death. And one of the main reasons for this desire for distractibility is because it preoccupies people from thinking about what is inevitable, that they will die. The Prophet Sallallahu said, أَكْثَرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذَا مِنْ لَذَّاتِ Do much remembrance of the destroyer of delights, death. Not in a morbid sense. This is being unto death. This is embracing our mortality, being aware of it. Marabat al-Hajj, every night, did death meditation. He would recite poems about death. Shaykh ibn al-Habib in his diwan, tazawudu akhi. You know, be prepared for death. فَإِنَّهُ نَازِرُ and it's coming. And they used to sing this on a, on, a, on a regular basis, to think about death. The Prophet ﷺ was completely aware of the presence of death. The Qur'an, death permeates the Qur'an. There's not a page that doesn't have the perfume of death scented on it in the Qur'an. And this is not morbidity, this is not some kind of morbid or morbidness. It's not morbidness, it's actually to make you aware of the preciousness of the time that you have been given. This is the preciousness of life itself. It's a great gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we waste it away with all of this insignificant concern. There's one of the interesting things about the ancient Greeks is they were actually very concerned about distraction. But what they saw was that it was an inner failure to use one's time on what one claimed to value the most. Their reason for treating distraction so seriously was straightforward, and it's the reason we ought to do so too. What you pay attention will define you. It will define you. What you pay attention to will define you. Seneca wrote a, a famous uh, short book called The Shortness of Life. He was a, he was a great Roman uh, philosopher and, and, and uh, one of the notables from Rome. And he talks about you know, his fellow Romans pursuing political careers. They didn't really care about holding elaborate banquets. They didn't really enjoy baking their bodies in the sun. I mean, he literally says that, sunbathing, something Europeans tend to do, other peoples don't need to. And to be honest, I suspect he probably was, right? But the crucial point isn't that it's wrong to choose to spend your time relaxing, whether at the beach or on BuzzFeed. It's that the distracted person isn't really choosing at all. I mean, that's the key. You're not choosing. It's quite the opposite. The word in Arabic is one of my favorite Arabic words. Akhtara. It literally means, if you look at it 
Khayr, it comes from Khayr. So Akhtara is, is a form in Arabic which is, it's to internalize something. So you're choosing the good. That's what Ikhtiar is. But it's either a real or an apparent good. That's the difference. And so distracted people are not choosing. They're not choosing a real or even an apparent good. They're surfing. Everything will pull their attention. It's called the noonday devil in, in, in the old scholastic tradition. Sloth, spiritual laziness, people that don't want to, uh, to think about the inevitable. One of the uh, amazing things, and this is what I wanted to, uh, to really talk about, is one of our most important books and it really is, it had an immense impact on Imam al-Ghazali, is a book known as the Risala of Imam al-Qushayri. This was a foundational book in Tasawwuf. And Tasawwuf is part and parcel with the religion of Islam. You cannot take Tasawwuf out of the religion of Islam without deracinating it, without uprooting it. There are many different types of Sufis. There are many Sufis that went astray, just like there's fuqaha that went astray, there's mutakallimun that went astray. Every science has its problems. But the idea somehow that tasawwuf, like that mentioned in the Risal of Imam al-Qashiri, wasn't from Islam, nobody would have accepted that, including Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abd al-Wahhab. So, in the Risal of Imam al qushayri he has a chapter called Al-Waqt, time. And he says, حقيقه الوقت عند اهل التحقيق حادث متوهم علق حصوله على حادث متحقق. That time for the people who have had realization, these are the verifiers, the people that have penetrated the, the reality of this religion and they have confirmed that it is true and that if you practice it, you will get the results. In other words, it's falsifiable. This is Popper's argument for a true science is that it can be replicated. So the muhakkahun are the people that replicate again and again the truths that were told in our tradition. They falsify the religion. They show you that over and over again, we do these things and we get the same results. Therefore, it is a science. It's not waham. It's not an illusion. So he says that with the people of tahqiq, it is something that is mutawaham. It's not something tangible. It's something like illusory time but it's associated with something that is actually substantial. What he means by that is that for us, we don't know if we're gonna have the next minute. So I can make my plans for tomorrow. Tomorrow will come for a lot of people, but it's not gonna come for everybody. That's the quality that it's mutawaham. And this is why Sahal was asked when will the human being finally be still? And he says, He will never be still until he knows that the only time he has is the moment that he is in. And this is why Allah says about the awliya, Ala inna awliya Allah, la alayhim. In other words, they have no fear of the future. And they don't grieve. They have no grief about the past because they are Ibn Waqtihi. They're here. They're present. They're mindful. They're fully aware. This is the difference between them and everybody else. They are present. So that is what he's telling us. So he says, a man will say, I'll come at the beginning of next month. He doesn't really know that. He only hopes he'll, he'll see him. But the, 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 the beginning of that next month will come. It will come, but you might not come with it. 
And that is the nature of time. And then he says, I heard Abu Ali al Daqaq, one of the great Arifin, say, Rahimullah, Al Waktu ma anta bihi in kunta bid dunya, fa waktu ka dunya, wa in kunta bil uqba, fa waktu kal uqba, wa in kunta bil surur, fa waktu ka surur, wa in kunta bil husni, fa waktu kal husan. You read to be hada an al waqt ma kan al gharib al insan. That's exactly what. I was saying earlier, what you give your attention to is your reality. This is exactly what Abu Ali al Daqaq said, Rahimullah. The time, the moment, because waqt can be moment, it can be time. Atikum waqtan, you know, like, it, it, it can, it, you know, this is the Arabic language. Time is what you are in. If you are in the dunya, your time is the dunya. If you are in the afterlife, your time is the afterlife. If you are in joy, your time is joy. And if you're in grief, your time is grief. And then he says, he means by this that time is essentially what overwhelms the human being. It's your experience. That's what time is. It's human experience. And this is what the clock has taken away from us. The clock is qu this quantifiable thing. Time is not quantifiable in reality. Time, Allah is time. Allah is, uh, the, the scholastics, and I think they took it from us. The scholastics called it nunkstans. God is the eternal now. If you look at in uh, Ta'rifat, Imam Jurjani says, Ad-Dahar huwa al-an ad daim It is the eternal now. It's the now that stands still. God is time. La tusub ad-Dahar fa inna an ad-Dahar bi yadi al-layl wa nahar. Do not curse time because I am time. I am time. Some of the ulama interpret it as batinu, batinu zaman. It's, the, it's what the zaman is to the outward, time is to the inward. Anyway, he goes on. It's a stunning... Um, Thing. He, he talks about, you know, Imam Shafi'i, he said, I learned two things from the Sufis. Time is a sword. If you don't cut with it, in other words, if you're not attentive, it will cut you down. We don't kill time. Time kills us. Whenever you hear somebody say, oh, I'm going to go kill some time, that is a person in complete ghafla. Whenever you hear somebody, you know, Ibn Atayillah, he said, the fool gets up in the morning and says, what am I going to do today? And the wise man gets up and says, what is God going to do with me today? So he said, and then he said, Your ego is such that if you do not preoccupy it, Focus it on the good, it will focus you on the, on, the, on the harmful, on the evil, on the bad. Allah. Again, Abu Ali al Daqaq said, Arwaktu mibrad, yashaquka, warayam haquka. Time is a file, it just wears you down, it doesn't obliterate you, it wears you down till there's nothing left. And this is why time is so important. He ends this by saying, Every day passes, it takes a part of me. And it, it's, it, it gives remorse to my heart, in other words, for the time I wasted. And then it continues on. It continues on. And then he says, It's like the people of the fire whose skin is reborn. And this is from the Quran. It says every time the skin gets burnt, Allah recreates it. I mean, this is, we know about these proprioceptors. Now, receptive, all the skin has these receptors. That's why burn, people that get burnt really deeply, they, they don't feel it once they've gone through the skin. So the skin, according to the Quran, is recreated. It's recreated so that the, the, uh, the receptors experience it. And then he says, لَيْسَ مَنْ مَاتَ فَاسْتَرَاحَ بِمَيْتٍ إِنَّمَا الْمَيْتُ مَيْتُ الْأَحْيَاءِ The dead one is not the one who uh, dies and then finds repose. 
Rather, the dead is the dead among the living. The intelligent one is the one who's mindful of his time. He's giving the time its due. إِنْ كَانَ وَقْتُهُ صَحُوا فَقِيَامُهُ بِالشَّرِيعَةِ وَإِنْ كَانَ وَقْتُهُ الْمَحُوا فَالْغَارِبُ عَلَيْهِ أَحْكَامُ الْحَقِيقَةِ So he's either in the haqiqa or in the sharia, depending on what time it is. So th these are very high meanings. And Imam Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, he says that don't... Uh, he says people يُطَارِبُوا عَلَى حَسَبَ hal. They should be looked at according to their station. So what is asked of the, 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 the people who are content with being common people. We should all aspire to, to rise up to be higher than our position. And common people is not the street sweeper. The street sweeper might be a, a knower of God. So common people in the Western understanding are people that don't have degrees and haven't gone to college and haven't uh, gotten PhDs and things like that. Very often, those are the most common people. They're the most common people. So, uh, the, the, uh, I wanted to uh, now just talk a little bit about why we celebrate. Uh, really, we should celebrate every day uh, the birth of our Prophet and the fact that he came into the world. We should be joyful. And one of the things about Muslims is that wherever you go, it's a hallmark of the Muslims that they loved our Prophet This is a quality that you find all over the world. Even people, bad Muslims, often love the Prophet And I'll give you one example. When I was in England, there was a Kuwaiti man. I shouldn't have said Kuwaiti, but anyway, uh, I said it, so uh, may God veil us all. Um, anyway, there was a man from the Gulf who, who was, uh, he was in a bar and he was drinking and, uh, and then the man asked him where he's from. He said, Kuwait. He said, oh, that's Muslim, isn't it? He said, yeah. He said, uh, and then he said something about the Prophet Sallallahu Well, this Kuwaiti man broke his bottle and jabbed this man, right? And obviously you shouldn't do that and, and really, I mean, but, but the impulse is real. The impulse is real. There's people in, you know, somebody said to me, oh, Muslims are always killing people over religion. I said, well, I was in England at the time. I said, you guys kill people over football matches. You know, I mean, and, and in fact, there used to be a billboard that said, if your religion's football, worship was Skype, Sky, Sky. It was like a football channel. Because there are people that that's their religion. That's their attention is given to that. They watch all the games. They know all the names. They have all the, the stats. They know who can bend it like Beckham, right? I mean, it's very interesting. This is people giving their time. And that's all we have is our time. This is what God has given us. This is a great gift that he's given us, participation in being. So the Prophet Sallallahu he, he was the most mindful of human beings. And that's really what I after you know thinking about mindfulness and thinking about just how how so many people in the west are are looking at these religions like buddhism and they've never considered islam it just fascinates me because our, our prophet sallallahu is so extraordinary and one of the most extraordinary things about our Prophet Sallallahu is his name. Because all over the world right now, right now, here we are in California. Right now, there's people all over the world doing Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa qulubi wa dawaiha Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad All over the world. They're praising our Prophet and his name is Muhammad. That's not a name he got later. His mother named him Muhammad, and it was an unknown name to the Arabs, but she was commanded to name him Muhammad. So just in his name is a proof of who he is, because he is the most praised human being on the planet. And the second, I, I arguably, is Mary. 
I mean, Mary, people all over the millions, hundreds of millions of people all over the world praise Mary. But I've never met any Christians that sit there saying, you know, oh God, praise Jesus, you know, bless Jesus. I, I've never seen that. And I've actually, the, in Genesis, it says, God will bless the nation that blesses Abraham. I asked an evangelical friend of mine, have you ever blessed Abraham? And he said, I can't think that I have. And I said, we bless him every day, at least five times a day. And so by your own book, it says we're a blessed nation. <laughs> because we bless Abraham. And of all people, the prophet in a sahih hadith said, that he was, he was shown all, all of these prophets and he said who they looked like. He actually told them which tribe they looked like. Beni Shinua, Moses looked like the people from Beni Shinua. Uh, Jibril looked like Dihya. He, he said what, the, what they looked like. And then he said, وَرَأَيْتُ Ibrahim, وَأَقْرَبُهُ shabahan صَاحِبُكُمْ The one that looked most like Abraham is your companion. What a beautiful, not your teacher, not your sheikh, not your, your companion, sahibukum. It's just, man rafa'uhullah, our prophet was the most humble of human beings. He loved people. He cared about people. He was, he was moderate in every single thing that, it's amazing. This is another proof of the Prophet ﷺ, his moderation. He said, my way is the middle way, meaning the moderate way. We made you a moderate nation, a people in the middle. Even geographically, the bulk of Muslims are in the middle of the earth. They're not at the extremes. They're in the middle of the earth. Everything about him is moderation. The Prophet ﷺ, they said about him, Anas said, كان نبيه ربعة من القوم he, he was of middle stature. He was neither too tall, nor was he short. But, nobody ever appeared taller than him. But he wasn't tall or short. He was middle. He said, He was of a moderate color, inclining toward a reddish, light brown. He, wasn't, he was neither dark, nor was he a pasty white, amhaq, like uh, the Europeans, you know, the northern Europeans. The Italians are closer to that color. It's the most beautiful of colors, azhar alone. I once asked Murab Tarhaj, when they described the Prophet like the full moon, did they mean the harvest moon on the horizon with that, uh, that beautiful coloring that it has? Or the, the real brilliant white? And, and he turned to the... <laughs> he turned to some of the students, he said, Rome. Like, look at the questions of the Romans. He said, <laughs> for him, Rome was Ben Al Asfar, you know. So, he said it was like the moon on the horizon. And that's somebody who's an eyewitness. And then he said, Rajad al he, he had wavy hair. It was neither straight nor was it kinky. It was middle. Everything about him was middle. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the other uh, aspect about him, and I want to because we were... Um, There's a, uh, from the, the, uh, the Buddhist tradition, there's a book on Chan Buddhism with very interesting stories from the, the masters. And uh, one of the, the, the students asked the teacher, do inanimate things teach? And he said, Inam inanimate things teach. He said, why can't I hear it? He said, because you can't hear. And then he said, who hears it? And he said, the saints hear it. And then he said, do you hear it? He said, no, if I heard it, you wouldn't hear my teaching. <laughs> and then he said, 
can the common people ever hear? And he said, if they could, they wouldn't be common anymore. And so, an inanimate things. How is it that all the Sahaba, mutawatir hadith, heard the tree trunk moan? Because they were all saints. If they hadn't been saints, they couldn't have heard it. When the palm, when the pebbles in his palm praised Allah, not everybody heard it. But Abu Bakr and Omar heard it. These are maqams. So he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, heard things. He heard trees greet him. He heard mountains greet him. He said, Uhud jabnun yuhibbuni wa uhibhud. Uhud is a mountain that loves me and I love him. The Taoists say sages love mountains and mountains love sages. These are, these are teachings that are throughout because these, these truths have been given to all people. But we are the last inheritors. And this is the gift of our Prophet ﷺ to us, that we are from the last ummah of mindfulness in an age of utter distraction. This is his gift to us, a path to becoming awakened, not woke, it's bad grammar, awakened. <laughs> the path to becoming awakened. And grammar is la tusma'u fiha laghiya in the Quran, in Jannah, you don't hear bad grammar. <laughs> That's one of the meanings of laghiya. It, it also means anything just empty. You don't hear empty speech. That's the primary meaning. The ishara is no bad grammar. The Prophet ﷺ loved beautiful language. He, he enjoyed hearing the poets come to him and they would say things and he would tell. In fact, when Hassan ibn Thabit, when he was, he said, he said, your, your, your invective is harder on these, these uh, kufar than, than our spears. He said, invect and may the Holy Spirit give you aid in doing that. One of the sahaba who was known for uh, just his humor one day was making all of the sahaba laugh and the prophet was there and he poked him in his side like it's enough and the prophet had a beautiful sense of humor but humor should be like salt it shouldn't be the whole meal and so he poked him and he said Ojatani, that hurt and the prophet said Iqtas. then take your take your vengeance and he said, you have a shirt under and I don't. So the Prophet lifted up his shirt and exposed his khasira, like the hip. And he grabbed it and he kissed him. He said, that's all I wanted. He was the most attentive to his guest. And this is a hallmark of all the salihin. Every virtuous human that I've visited Always the guest. Let him honor his guest. If you believe in the, uh, Allah and the last day, let him honor his guest. So, this is our Prophet ﷺ. Now, how do, we, how do we become mindful? This is the question. And one of the the most important ways, Allah says, Ya yuhal ladina amanu, udhkuru Allah dhikran kithira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa dhikir, fa inna dhikra tanfa' al mu'mineen. Remind them. In other words, call their mind to attentiveness, to attention. Remind them because reminders benefit the believers. In other words, they will become mindful by being reminded, by being brought back to reality. And so the Prophet ﷺ, one of his names is al mudhakkir the one who reminds, who brings you back to your mindfulness, to your remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my, I had a teacher, he was a beautiful teacher. He was a Sudanese, Ahmed, Sheikh Ahmed Badwi, Tayyib al-Asma. And I read with him the Muatta. He was a student of Muhammad Habibullah Wadmi Abbas. So I had a 
direct connection to one of the greatest muhadithin of the 20th century. He was a Mauritanian, brilliant Mauritanian scholar, who when he went to Al-Azhar and uh, he wanted to teach in the masjid, so all the Azharis wanted to test him. So when they came in, they, he said, let's do ta'arruf. And so the first one said, I'm Sheikh so-and-so. He said, Ibn Man. He said, 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 that's far as I go back. Each one gave their whole, all their lineage. And he began by giving his lineage. So when he finished, he said, salam alaikum. Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Salam alaikum Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan Salam alaikum Fulan ibn And he went through all of them and when it came to him he said man ana and none of them could repeat his, his uh, lineage. So they said you can teach hadith. <laughs> so he studied with him, he was a, he was, he was a mufti in the, in the UAE in the, in the court when I was a student there. But he wrote a little book which he designed it so that if you did these, you would be from the dhakirin Allah dhikran kathira. And when I told Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya that we had translated this book, Dr. Asad and I, that um, he said his father used to say, whoever does these dhikrs, the, they're called ad'i rahwal, the munasabat, the occasional uh, supplications. He said, whoever does them on a regular basis will be written from the dhakirin Allah dhikran kathira. So this is a beautiful way to become mindful, is to try to remember and to habituate ourselves to these things, but also to do them with intention. In other words, not formulaic and not perfunctory, not in some way in which uh, you, you go on to automatic pilot, where you actually stop and you, you supplicate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umm Salama said, the Prophet said, never left the house, except he said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika na dhilla o dhalla, o azilla o zalla, o adhlima o adhrama, o ajhala o yujhala alayya. This is a perfect prayer. And I know of no other religion that has these prayers. I, I don't know any other religion that has these prayers. It's to me one of the proofs of our Prophet ﷺ is that all of these prayers are so stunningly beautiful. They're very difficult to translate because they're so comprehensive. He said, Utitu Jawami al Kalam. I was given the comprehensive words. He he says so much with so few words. So when he went out, he said, Oh Allah, I seek refuge that I should trip or be tripped. That I should go astray or be led astray that I should oppress anyone or be oppressed, or wrong anyone or be wronged, that I should become angry or foolish, or somebody should display their anger or foolishness on me, against me. That's a protective dua as you go out. When he went, into the, when he went to relieve himself, he said, Allahumma inna a'udhik bi minar khubti wal khaba'ith. Because these are foul things, like emptying yourself, even though nothing foul came from the Prophet ﷺ. And the earth swallowed up. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came out, he said, Ghufranaka, you know, your forgiveness. And then he said, Alhamdulillah, what a perfect dua. Praise be to the one who provided me the, the delight of the food, retained in me the, 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 the energy of the food, and removed from me the harm of the food. This, these are perfect prayers, perfect prayers. So all of these things that the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to bed, Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. In another riwayah, which is muttafaqun alayhi, he actually says that, Aslam tu nafsi ilayk, I, I have surrendered myself to you. Wa fawatu amri ilayk, I have given my whole affair to you. Wa jahtu dhahri ilayk, and put my back to you, in other words, for protection. Raqbatan wa rahbatan ilayk. And then he says, I believe in, in, in you, I believe in your Prophet. And, 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 and the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever says these things and then dies has died on fitra. This is the real human being. This is the fitra. So, وَطَعْتُ جَنْبِي وَبِكَ أَرْفَعُهُ فِي نَمْسَكْتَ نَفْسِي فَرْحَمْهَا وَإِنْ أَرْسَلْتَ فَحْفَظْهَا He said, go to sleep and not expect to get up in the morning. This is attentiveness to time. People die in their sleep. We don't know. We're living in a place, earthquakes happen. The, the house could collapse. When waking from sleep, 
this, I, I slept in the tent of Murab uh, Hajj for uh, the first few months that I was with him. And then I actually asked because it, it, was, it was very intense. Um, he did dhikr all the time. He did dhikr in his sleep. And I have only seen a few people that do dhikr in their sleep. There, there was one man, Sidi Ali, in, uh, in Meknes, who I was with him. And, and, and he was sleeping and snoring and doing prayer on the Prophet Wasallam. And he was fast asleep. So, I mean, I saw that with my own eyes. But Murabd al-Hajj used to say, La ilaha illallah. The Prophet said, uh, My eye sleeps, but my heart doesn't sleep. So there's people that do dhikr so much that they're even in their sleep, they're doing dhikr. In fact, Sahaba used to have to put rocks when they went to the bathroom, they would put rocks in their mouth to remind themselves not to say the name of Allah. So every time the, the Murabat al-Hajj got up, the very first thing he would do, Alhamdulillah, uh, but then he would recite from Ali Imran, which is in the hadith. He would recite the last uh, from, uh, he would look up at the, st the stars. The Prophet used to nazar of Najum, and he would recite those verses. That's coming into consciousness. When making wudu, ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahduhu la shirika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Wudu is an act of ibadah that many people are deprived of because they do it only for the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ used to do wudu as an act of ibadah. When you see, when we first saw uh, the, the people in Tuaymarat, the way they did wudu, Murabat al-Hajj did wudu, it was just amazing how, how he did wudu. And, uh, and he would always, uh, when he completed, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahirin. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruku wa tubu ilayk. This was the dua on the completion of wudu. Allahumma ghfir li dhanbi wa wasi' li fi dari wa barak li fi rizqi. It was a beautiful dua. And that's what's sa'li fi dari. You're, you know, a man can be in a cell, like Tobias Tubbs, could be in a cell, and, 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 and he's, he's, ex, he's in an expansive place. Another person could be in a mansion, and he's in a cell. Because it's subjective. It's all how you perceive reality. This is one of my favorite du'as. It's just such a beautiful du'a. And then when he got on a camel, which is taken from the Quran also, always the akhirah. Because time for, for pre modern people was always related to eternity. This is why when you eat, Alhamdulillah, Ata'amani, wa saqani, wa arwani, wa ashba'ani, wa ja'alani min al Muslimin. The, 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 the ni'ma baqiyah is always mentioned with the ni'ma thaniya. Food is a, uh, a, a blessing that dissipates, but submission to Allah is a blessing that goes on forever. This is also when leaving the home. Allahum inni asaruka. This is khayra mawlaj wa khayra al-makhraj. Bismika la walaj. Now this is when you come into the house. Bismillah kharajna wa ala rabbina tawakkalna thumma li yusallam ala ahlihi coming into the home. When heading to the masjid, one of my favorite also. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi noora wa fi lisani noora wa ja'al fi sam'i noora wa ja'al fi basri noora wa ja'al min khalfi noora wa min amami noora wa ja'al min fawqi noora wa min tahti noora Allahumma a'tini noora and in a riwayah Allahumma ja'alni noora and he had no shadow. Ibn Hajar says he had no shadow. This is something that the Salaf said. He was always shaded by clouds. But he had no shadow, sallallahu alayhi wa One of the proofs of his hairs are if you cast a light on them, they don't, they don't show shadow. Allahumma ja'alni nura, make me light. God placed light in my heart, light on my tongue. Light in my hearing, light in my sight, place light behind me, light before me, place light above me, light below me. Oh God, make me light, grant me light. 
when entering the masjid, Allah miftah li abwaaba rahmatika. And then mindfulness, he entered with his right foot first and made this dua. When leaving the masjid, left foot, Allahumma inni asaruka min fadrika, because the rahma is in the masjid, the fadl is in the world, the bounty of the world. When hearing the adhan, إِذَا سُمِعْتُمْ النِّدَا فَقُولُوا مِثْرَ مَا يَقُولُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ And then when, when, when you finish it, Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wata tamma wa saratir qa'ima aati Sayyidina Muhammadan we, no, Sayyid, the Prophet ﷺ is our Sayyid. Uh, so, some, most of the, these riwayahs have without the Sayyid, but it's been the, the urf of the Muslims to, to say Sayyid, uh, our Prophet ﷺ, just out of adab to him. I mean, th there's a position, and, and this is a position that's a totally valid position, that it's also the adab to, uh, to, to, to do it just as it came down. And there are people that do that. So both are correct, but... I've always found it difficult not to say Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, uh, don't call him like you call other people. You know, one of the uh, tragedies of the modern time is first name. Every, everybody's on a first name basis. You know, I hate these people, they call you up. Hello, Hamza. I'm like, it's Colonel Hamza to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, what, like why, why, why do people assume that they can just call you by your first name? People used to take a long time before you gave them your first name. If you look at the old English like Jane Austen, they called people by their last name, like Willoughby. That's not his name. His name was John Willoughby, but they called him Willoughby because he was called by his last name. And if it was an elder, then they would call them Sir or Mr. We say Abu Yahya, you know, Abu Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You give the kunya. That's how the Arabs do it. One of the things that I realized, because I went to a Catholic school in high school, and they, they always called you by your last name. This was, you know, early 70s, so it hadn't changed yet to the degree. But they always called you by your last name. So, you know, if you raise your hand, they say, Mr. Hansen. That's how they called you. And my father went to the same school. And what I realized later is that the whole purpose of that is that you don't just represent yourself, you represent a family, you have a family name, that you shouldn't dishonor your family name. So we're in a time when it's just everybody's an individual. They no longer have any sense of being part of a family or a community. So it's, it's one of the tragedies, I think, of this, all this familiarity. And then, Allahumma had iqbaru laylika wa idbaru naharika wa aswatu duatika, faghfirli, forgive me. You know, this, oh God, now is the arrival of your night, the departure of your day, and the sound of your caller, so forgive me. Al Bukhari, Imam al Bukhari. Bismika ladi la ilaha illahu, when on dress to go to the bath or, or sleep. Bismillah, Allahumma jinnibna shaitan, wa jinnib shaitan, wa jinnib shaitan ma razaktana. You know, in the name of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يُلَامِسْ أَهْلُهُ If you're going to be intimate, then this is something to say uh, to protect uh, the, the child. أَعُوذُ بِكَرِمَاتِ الْأَيْتَامِ مَاتِ مِنْ غَضَبِهِ وَشَرِّ عِبَادِهِ وَمِنْ هَمَزَاتِ الشَّيَاطِينِ وَيَحْضُرُونَ Very, uh, if you wake up from a fright, you say this in sleep. Um, there are many, many of these. I mean, we have beautiful books. Imam al wrote a fantastic book, Tuhfat al dhakirin Imam al nawis great book, uh, Al-Adhkar. It's, it's one of the finest books in our tradition. Um, there are many, and many, many scholars have written small books, like this one that my teacher wrote. Um, the, they want the barakah of teaching these things to people, so it's why people write Tajweed books. Like, it used to really bother me, Tajweed books. I, I see all these Tajweed books. They're all the same. They say the exact same thing. They're all little books, and they say the exact same thing. And I would like, why do people keep writing Tajweed books? Like, aren't there enough Tajweed books? And then I realized it's actually a brilliant thing to do because anybody that learns how to read the Quran from that book, the author of that book gets the reward <laughs> of all their recitation. So it's, this is why Shiuch always made their own awrad. That's I realized that. Because I went like, why do they keep making new awrad? Because they want the reward of the people doing the dhikr that they put together. It's one of the blessings of our religion. So I totally have no problem anymore with that because I get it. I want to do it. Like I'm going to write a book on tajweed, inshallah.
اللهم اغفر لذنبي كله دقه وجله واوره واخره وعلنيه وسره oh Allah forgive my sin this is in prostration forgive my sins entirely the lesser and the greater the first and the last the revealed and the concealed he also said you know uh, there are many many uh, beautiful iterations اللهم اغفر لي وارحمني واهديني واجبرني وعافيني وارزقني one of the things of the afia uh, one of the meanings of it according to imam al qushayri was to be focused on God. In other words, not to be distracted, which I thought was really interesting. You know, this is between the, the uh, tashahud and the salam again, between the uh, tashahud and salam. Uh, and these are the, what are called the baqiyat al-salihat. My recommendation to all of you, do the baqiyat al-salihat. This is one of the the most important things that you do after your prayer is the baqiyat of salihat these are the things that you say after the prayer there are different iterations but they're 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 very beautiful and they're extremely important uh, there's a whole bunch of them so these are in we're, we're actually gonna this is going to be published this month and given to all the 12,000 strong people and then just made available but there are good books like this there's a beautiful one that white thread press did uh, the, the the precious pearls Reflections from the Precious Pearls. It's a beautiful book that uh, a really fine sheikh from England uh, did. So there are many good books, and the khair of Allah is uh, without um, limits. Allahumma inni a'udhu bikum min al-jubni wa a'udhu bikum min al-bukhli wa a'udhu bikum min an uradda ila ardha lal-umr. This is a very important hadith given dementia, Alzheimer's, all these things are so prevalent. Wa a'udhu bikum min fitnat al-dunya wa a'dhab al-qabri. So oh Allah, very I seek refuge in you from timidity and stinginess. So fear, juban is like fear. Wa a'udhu bikum min al-bukhli. Bukhl is related to fear because you're afraid to give out your money. And in one, it's min al-ajzi wa kasal So the ajiz is the one who wants to do something, but they can't. The kaslan is the one who is able to do it, but doesn't want to do it. So he sought refuge from both. These are really stunning in their meaning. So these are, and then the dua from anxiety. Allahum inni abduku ibn abduku ibn amatika nasiyati biyadika maadhan fiya hukmuka. عَدْلٌ فِيَّ قَضَاءُكَ أَسْأَرُكَ بِكُلِّ اسْمٍ هُوَ لَكَ سَمَّيْتَ بِهِ نَفْسَكَ وَأَنْزَلْتُ فِي كِتَابِكَ أَوْ عَلَّمْتُ أَحَدًا مِنْ خَلْقِكَ أَوْ اسْتَأْثَرْتَ بِهِ فِي عِلْمٍ غَيْبِ عِنْدَكَ أَنْ تَجْعَلَ الْقُرْآنَ الْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمَ فِي رَبِيعَ قَلْبِي وَنُورَ صَدْرِي وَجَلَاءَ وَجِلَاءَ بِكِلَاهُمَا there's slight difference but essentially the same meaning وَجَلَاءَ or جِلَاءَ حُزْنِي وَذَهَبَ هَمِّي وَغَمِّي so again a beautiful comprehensive dua to make the Quran the Rabi' of your heart. And one of the best ways that you can honor your Prophet is to, to read the Quran. The Prophet said the best ibadah of my ummah is Quran in prayer and then Quran outside of prayer. This is the best ibadah that you can do. If you're, if you're not doing a juz of Quran a day then, and you're doing other things, I would set aside those other things and focus on doing a juz a day. Every Muslim should do a khatam of Qur'an every month. I mean, this is baseline. Um, and if you, if you, it would take about half an hour. You could do 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in, in the evening. Once you get accustomed to reading it at a relative pace, it's, uh, what do you say? Qari Omar. Yeah. You, how, how, how fast can you do with hadar? How? how yeah, about 20. Huh? Yeah, so you, if you do hadar, you can do it in 20 minutes. So 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the This is not a lot of your time. It's, you know, and the book, it's, it's so neglected, and the Prophet complained of its neglect. My people have, have abandoned this Quran. And one of the great blessings of Morocco, and one of the things I love about that, country is every masjid 250,000 khatam every year every month in, in th that's what the ministry of awqaf has um, determined based on all the 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 hizb subhanallah so this is a beautiful dua and then istikhara is very important 
He used to teach istikhara for everything. And this is something, I'll tell you a true story. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayo was in Jordan and they were on their way. It was very late at night and they were on their way to the airport and the driver fell asleep and crashed into a telephone pole. He died. Uh, the, Sheikh Abdullah broke his nose and there was blood everywhere. And his son, and this is a true story, his son told me this. He was in the car and he's, his son started screaming because he was worried his dad was seriously injured. He was actually, it wasn't that bad of an injury, but there, because there was so much blood, he thought it was really serious. He screamed and he said his, his father took his arm, squeezed it and said, Labas, astakhartullah. Don't worry, I did istikhara before this trip. That's, that's the power of this. That's the power of the prophetic teaching is that you, 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 you are in the hub, you're in that place where you're not perturbed by the world. And things are going to get very serious on this planet. We're, we're entering into a new phase and people need to have strong iman and they need to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need to be connected. I mean, one of the things about Edith Stein that was so amazing, she actually, when, when she fled to, uh, when she fled to, uh, after Kristallnacht, when they were persecuting the Jews, she fled to, uh, they took her to Belgium. And she was in a monastery there. And uh, she used to go out into the cold, like she was preparing for something. And this is eyewitness people that saw this. She was taken to Auschwitz when the Nazis invaded and they took even the converts to Catholicism because she had converted out of Judaism to Catholicism. But she took her to Auschwitz. There were eyewitness accounts that she was comforting people in that situation. And she only was there for one week. They, she was killed right away. But the point is, is that people of Iman can deal with this. When they, people don't know this, but in, Turk, in, uh, in, in Korea, when they captured the Americans, they captured Turks with them. So they were actually imprisoned together. And when they studied, the Americans all fell apart and they actually started doing uh, uh, recordings for the, Kore for the Koreans, like communist propaganda. And they were very worried about this because they felt they were brainwashed. It was all from the interrogation, but the Turks didn't. They didn't succumb to the interrogation. And they wanted to understand why. And what they found out was two things that the Turks did. One, they laughed a lot because they saw the ridiculousness of what they were trying to do in the brainwashing. So they just would watch these people telling them these things and they thought it was funny. And I, I know that that's from a type of iman where you kind of recognize the hilarity of this dunya and the stupidity of human beings. And I know it had to do with their upbringing as Muslims. The other thing that they did, they always appointed, because they would take away the officers and the morale would break down with the Americans. The Turks always appointed an Amir. So they always, even when if it was a private, they would appoint somebody over them and he would keep them all together. So these are really, really important things to remember. We need to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, there's so many things we could talk about. Who are we to talk about the Messenger of Allah? One of my favorite um, poems is from the great, uh, the great poet, uh, the great faqih, uh, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, who is to me one of the most extraordinary scholars that our ummah produced. He wrote a beautiful tafsir of the Quran. He was one of those polymaths that just seemed to know everything. Um, one of the beauties of his books and one of my teachers, Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar Shinqiti, was the son of the great Mufassar. He was the one that really um, first introduced me to Ibn Juzay in Medina when I was very young. But one of the things that really he said was why his books were so powerful is because he wrote them for his son. He wrote them for his son. So he wanted his son to learn from these books. And this is one of the reasons why the sunnah, if, if your parent dies, the sunnah is for the son to pray over the parent, not for the sheikh or the imam. Why? Because nobody will pray with the fervor that a son will pray for his, his parent. So that's one of the secrets of uh, our fiqh. 
So uh, he said, Arumu imtidah al Mustafa fayuruduni. I attempt to praise the chosen one, but I'm thwarted. Fayuruduni qusuri an idraki tirk al manaqbi. I can't get to that, that station, that exalted height of praising him. The Prophet said, and then he says, "Womanli bi hasr al bahri wal bahru zakhirun." Who can measure the ocean and the ocean is vast? وَمَنْلِي بِإِحْصَاءِ الْحَصَى وَالْكَوَاكِبِ And who can enumerate the, the, the stones and the stars? وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَعْضَائِي غَدَتْ أَلْسُنًا إِذًا لَمَا بَلَغَتْ فِي الْمَدْحِ بَعْضَ مَآرِبِ Even if my whole body became tongues, even then I wouldn't be able to give the praise that I desired. وَلَوْ أَنَّ جَمِيعِ الْعَالَمِينَ تَآلَفُوا عَلَى مَدْحِهِ لَمْ يَبْلُغُوا بَعْضَ وَاجِبِي If all of creation got together to praise the Prophet ﷺ, they would not achieve that due. They would not achieve that due. فَأَمْسَكْتُ عَنْهُ هَيْبَةً وَتَأَدُّبًا so I have refrained out of awe and adab. And out of fear and magnifying that exalted station. And sometimes silence is the best eloquence. And sometimes speech gives faults for the fault finders. So having said that, and knowing my own limitations, I wrote a poem uh, for the Prophet Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Saratun tunjina biha min jami' al-ahwari wa lafat wa taqdi lana biha jami' al-hajat wa tutahiruna biha min jami' al-sayyat wa tarfa'una biha ala darajat wa tuballiguna biha qsar ghayati min jami' al-ahirat The sun solemnly stated How can my light compare to his? And the moon laughed Be like me content to reveal another's light. The North Star declared, what guidance can I provide next to his? And all the stars exclaimed, be like us who revolve around you and show no envy. The sea shouted, what secrets can I contain when compared to his wonders? The clouds pleaded, be like us, exalted in the sky because we humbly draw our water from another and pour forth in gratitude and service. The rose ruefully remarked, What beauty do I have next to his? The mirror said, Be like me, who can only reflect another's beauty. Reason exclaimed, What wisdom can I reveal next to his revelation? The tongue replied, Be still and let me quote him. Gold complained, What worth do I have next to his? Copper cried, What ingratitude! Your purity was his from the start. Be happy to be compared to him. The dog barked. He mentioned me. The cat meowed. He petted me. The donkey brayed. He rode on me. The horse neighed. He called me an ocean. The camel grunted. I took him to safety. The frog croaked. I was his favorite. The spider stood tall on eight legs and stately stated, I protected him once. The cloud boasted, I shaded him. The tree declared, he called me and I bowed to him. The palm trunk said, well, he hugged me. The date gloated, I was sweet for him. Milk exalted, I nourished him. Water crowed, I quenched his thirst. The Kaaba shouted, he circled me. The Yemeni corner replied, he touched me. The black stone laughed and said, he kissed me. 
the pebbles yelled. We praised God in his palm. The mountains of Mecca called out. He loved us. Medina demurely whispered, he chose me. And humanity cried, nafsi, nafsi, me, me. And God said, be like Ahmed. And Ahmed said, ummati, ummati, my community, my community. And God replied, we will grant you until you are content. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan.